Hello, this is a uh, re-recording of the 6HD, so the Hacker Tools class uh, lecture on shell and scripting. Um, we sort of realized that this is a very um, sort of screen heavy uh, lecture. And it was really unfortunate that in the original lecture, we did not actually have the screencast. So I figured I would just redo it with a proper microphone and with the screencast, as you can see. Um, hopefully you find this useful. The content is pretty much the same as the original lecture. And I recommend that you open up the lecture notes for this lecture, which is basically what I'll be going through, adding some detail as we go along. Um, so the shell is a really efficient textual interface to your computer. Um, and it might be something you're familiar with, it might not be, um, but in general, you can do almost everything through the shell. And once you start becoming productive with the shell, um, you should find that you don't really need your mouse all that much anymore. The mouse is pretty much handy for the browser and not much else on your computer. Um, when you open the shell, you're greeted with something that looks a little bit like what's on my screen right now. So this is called your shell prompt. Um, and it basically lets you run programs and commands. Uh, there are a lot of common ones. So for example, there's make dir. Let's just make a foobar directory. Um, so this made a directory called foobar um, in my home directory that I'm then now gonna change directory into. So I'm gonna cd into foobar. Um, there are commands like ls, which list what files are in that directory. Currently there are none. Uh, and there's move and copy. So for example, if I touch, we'll create an empty file. So I'm gonna touch foo, touch bar. If I now ls, you see I have the fi files bar and foo. M mv moves a file. So I can basically rename bar to bus, and now the files are bus and foo. And I could copy foo uh, into foo bar. Uh, and now I have three files and the contents of foo bar are the same as the, the contents of foo. So this, this is sort of the very basic shell stuff that pretty much everyone knows. Um, but the thing is, the shell lets you do so much more than that. You can invoke any program on your computer. Um, and usually command line tools exist for uh, doing pretty much anything you may want to do. Um, and they're often a lot more efficient than their sort of GUI counterparts, their graphical counterparts. Um, and we're going to go through a bunch of those in this lecture. Um, the shell provides what is essentially an interactive programming language. It's often referred to as scripting. Um, and there are a lot of different shells that all have effectively different languages. Um, you might have heard of or probably even used uh, either sh or bash. So the prompt I currently have open is a normal bash prompt. It is what you normally get when you install any Linux system. Uh, sh is, so this is bash, B-A-S-H, the born again shell. Um, there is also sh, which is sort of the original shell. Um, the two are mostly compatible. sh is a little simpler, but in general, sh you will have on any Linux system system bash you will probably have but you're not quite as guaranteed um, and this it gets weird once you go over to uh, other unix like systems so mac os for example uh, has sh but also has a really old version of bash so if you're trying to write a script that will work across um, different types of unixes you might want to skip, skip stick to just sh um, there are also um, shells that match particular languages better so for example there's c shell csh um, which looks a lot like the c language um, there are other shells that are uh, more geared towards sort of human use they often they're often referred to as like better shells um, so there is for example fish which is the one i personally use um, which they have a slogan that's something like uh, finally a shell from the 90s um, uh, there's zsh uh, or zish which is very popular which is basically a uh, someone who took bash and then made um, a version of Bash that's still backwards compatible, but has a lot of the sort of nice features you will want in a real shell. Um, there's also the corn shell, KSH, that is pretty popular. In general, I would say just you can choose any of these, they'll all be fine. What I will cover in this lecture is primarily Bash because it is the most ubiquitous one, but I would recommend that you look at either Zeech or Fish um, as sort of your main, main shell because they are a lot nicer to work with and come with nice features like uh, really good auto, inline auto completion. Um, so shell programming is uh, a very useful tool in your toolbox um, and you can the part of the reason for this is you can both write commands directly out on the command line. Like this will, in, this command line at now will interpret what I write as a program that it's going to execute. Um, you can also stick these commands in a in a file. So for example, I'm going to create something like a run.sh file, and at the top I'm going to add this line uh, bin sh, 
Um, and if I do this, this is known as a hash bang line. Um, if so here, let's, uh, so if you try to run a program, uh, that starts with the hash bang line, uh, what will happen is Linux will take the entire file contents of that file um, and pass them to the program that follows the hash bang. So for example, I'm gonna mark this file as executable so that we can run it. Um, and here, let's say that I do echo, which just prints something to standard out and say echo hello. If I now run this file, Notice that what happened was it printed hello. Not particularly interesting, um, but it turns out that you can do really fun things with this. Like I can do a run.py where I set the hash bang to uh, user bin Python. And then down here I do print hello from Python. Uh, and notice that if I now make run.py executable and run run.py, this now ran Python code. And so this hash bang trick is really useful if you just have some short program you want to run um, and you want to run it through some other program. Then a hash bang will basically tell Linux that the way you execute this file is take its contents and give it to this program. Um, so in this, in this uh, lecture, we'll primarily use uh, bin bash. Um, although keep in mind that anything that I put in this file, I could have also just run directly from the command line. Uh, so let's start, actually, let's start at the command line with something relatively simple. Let's say that I just want to do run some command a bunch of times. Well, bash has four loops, just like most other things. Although you'll notice that it's a little bit weird. Let me just write it out here. Um, so this is an example. Um, what this is saying, let's sort of walk through it uh, line by line and, or token by token and unpack it. So um, this is, you should read this as four x in list. So this is the list, this is the x, this is just any variable, um, and it's going to execute the body of the loop with x set to every value in this list. Um, semicolon terminates a command, um, and new lines are semicolons. Semicolons are new lines. And so this would be the same as if I put a new line right here, the semicolon. Uh, and for loops require that there's a semicolon before the do. Um, also notice that uh, for does or bash in general does not have curly brackets, which means that any construct that that adds a block, whether that's a um, a for loop, a while loop, an if statement, uh, case like switches, um, they basically have a unique keyword for starting the block and ending the block. So in this case, do starts the for block and done ends the for block. Uh, in other programming languages, this would be an open curly bracket and a closed curly bracket. Um, now, the way this actually works in Bash is that this list is really just um, space separated. So um, it's going to assign i for every space separated element in this list. Um, so how does that work exactly? Well, we'll get back to white space splitting a little bit later. Um, but basically, this thing right here, um, so let's just run it to see that it works. Um, if you try to run this command, you'll see that all sec i5 does is print the numbers from one through five. And so this is what is known as, um, uh, this is what is known as program substitution. Um, so basically what it does is it executes this program in here, and then it replaces this entire thing with the output of that program which means that this loop is equivalent to writing this. Those are exactly the same. And then bash is going to, so if I run this, it does the same thing. Um, bash is going to split this by white space, and then it's going to assign i to each of these values and run the body of the loop, which is just echo hello, which is why we get hello five times, with i set to that value. <clears throat> um, notice that everything in a shell script is a command. So in this case, echo hello. Um, echo is also just a program on your computer. In fact, if we type which echo, uh, which echo, echo is a program that's located right there. And what echo does is it prints out its, its arguments. It's very non-fancy. Um, and in fact, all of the commands that you can run this way without specifying exactly where they are, the way the shell finds them is using a variable called path. 
So the path is a colon separated list of directories where your shell should look for programs. So when I type echo, what the shell really does is it walks this list of paths and in each one, it searches for a program called echo. And if it finds it, it runs that one and stops searching. In my case, echo is in user bin. So it would look at this one, not find an echo, look in this one, not find an echo, look in this one, find an echo, and then run that program. Um, also notice that we have variables, right? So I here in this for loop is in fact a variable. And what that means is we can also do stuff with that variable. So if you go back here, instead of echoing hello, we get echo I, and what we then get is the numbers one through five. Notice that this is basically the same as just running sec I five. Um, and we could do something more useful, right? So in here, we could do, for example, ls, which prints the files in the current directory and do something like for f as in file, echo f. And this will print all of the files in the current directory, right? Uh, we can also set our own variables if we want in bash. So you can do something like foo equals bar and uh, echo foo. Um, notice though that bash is really, really picky about syntax. Uh, if you do this, what bash will interpret it as is uh, run the program foo with the first argument equals and the second argument bar, which is probably not what you wanted. And so for any variable assignment, you really do need to use it without spaces. Um, there are a bunch of special variables too that are defined in all scripts. Um, so if we go back to our run.sh program, uh, there is uh, $0, which is the name of the current program. So the sort of the name of self. Uh, there's $1 through $9, which is um, that argument to the program. So for example, if I now run they run sh with a, b, and c as the arguments. Then dollar zero, which we printed first, prints the name of the program itself. Dollar uh, one printed a, and we could print dollar two to get b, dollar three to get c, etc. Um, there are a couple of other things like um, you can echo dollar pound, which prints the number of arguments, uh, and dollar dollar, which is the process ID of the current shell of the current program. Right, so in this case, dollar zero was still the same. Uh, dollar pounds of the number of arguments is three, A, B, and C, uh, and this is the process ID of the shell that's running that program. Um, so let's see if we can do something more useful. So we have this for ls. Let's say that we only want to print directories. So let's make some directories here. We're going to make dir one and dir two. So if we ls here, you'll see that uh, dir one and dir two are both directories. That's what this leftmost bit indicates. These other bits are, is it readable? Is it writable? Is it executable? The first three are for user. The next three are for the same group. So in this case, the users group. And the last is for everyone who's not the user and not the group. Um, so let's say that we only want to list the directories in this folder. Well, this will list everything, which is not quite what we wanted. Uh, and so of course, bash also has if statements. Um, so I'm gonna write it out and then explain what it does. Um, Okay, so what we did here was utilize an if statement. So we're only gonna echo out dir and then the, the sort of the file that we were at, uh, if this is true. Now this construct might look a little bit weird. Um, the setup here is basically if condition then, oops, um, then body uh, and then fi. Right, so here we have then is sort of the open curly bracket, fi is the closed curly bracket. Uh, condition is a command that the shell is going to run. And in general, any program you run, well, always, but especially in the command line, will exit with a particular exit code. Um, so for example, if we look at, um, and the, the exit code will always be printed in, or stored in dollar question mark. So for example, if I try to remove a file that does not exist. So this told me that it does not exist. If I echo dollar question mark, it says one. If I try to remove a file that does exist like foo, and then try to echo dollar question mark, it prints zero. In general, any non-zero exit code means a failure, whereas zero means a success. And what if condition does is it runs the command and if its exit code is zero, then it executes the body, otherwise it does not. 
test here is also a program that's on my path, which test. Um, and test, I recommend you look at the man page for test. Um, but test basically takes an expression that it can be all sorts of things, but it, it's the kind of things you expect, like parentheses and or string comparisons, number comparisons, um, also various kind of tests on files. So you notice I use dash D, dash D file, uh, exits with true if file exists and is a directory, which is what we wanted in this case, right? So um, for this loop, um, if if f is indeed a directory, then test is going to exit with status code zero, and then it's going to do this echo. Um, so that's kind of cool. You can also, of course, do uh, else if. Um, so there's like an l if construct uh, where you give some other command. Uh, there's also an else if you want to do else. Um, and I recommend that you take a look at man test. Tests can do a lot of really useful things. Um, one thing that you might have noticed is that um, oftentimes you'll see this in bash scripts instead. Right? Notice that it does the same thing. Well, open square bracket is not that special. Open square bracket is also a program on your machine. It is literally called open square bracket. And in fact, if we look at man test, you'll see that a different alias, sorry, a different alias for test is open square bracket. So when you, what this is saying to bash, this statement right here is run the program open square bracket with the arguments dash D dollar F and close square bracket. So close square bracket is the final argument. And in fact, uh, if you run test with as open square bracket, uh, it requires that the last argument is a closed square bracket. Um, so you, you might think that, okay, great, we sort of did this correctly, but we run into some really weird cases like, what if I make a directory called my documents? Right? Let's see what happens if I run this now. Notice that my documents does not appear in this list, even though we made it as a directory. And if I ls, it is there, right? And it is a directory. So let's think about why that is. Well, remember how the way um, Bash knows how to loop over things is by white space splitting this. So ls is going to list my documents. But when we loop over all the items of its output, my is going to be an item and documents is going to be an item, but not together. So in fact, we can test this just by removing the if and echoing $f. Oops. Um, ah, that's not what I meant to do at all. That's even less what I meant to do. You'll see that when I do this loop, um, you see my and documents show up as separate things, right? Even though th when we actually list files, they show up as a single thing. Um, and this is a really big source of bugs in Bash. Like this behavior on white space, space splitting is just all sorts of problematic and it will cause you headache down the line. Um, so let's spend a little bit of time on trying to understand exactly how that bit works. So. Bash splits arguments by whitespace, and that is not always what you want. And often, the way to fix it is by doing quoting. Um, for example, uh, up in this example, remember how this is really just process substitution, right? So we could just as well say dir1, dir2, my documents. This is what the previous command expands to. If I know that my documents is a single string, I can do this, I can quote it. And now, um, Notice that it'll run, but it will exit with a different error. And the error is that down here, you'll see, we have the same problem here with our if. If f is my documents, f is going to be just put here as my documents, which means that test, or open square bracket, gets the arguments dash d, my documents, end square bracket. It is not expecting two arguments to follow dash d. It's only expecting a file name. And so here, we would have to also quote this variable in order for that to work. And then indeed, it does work. Um, 
Echo sort of happens to be okay because what Echo will do by default is it will print its arguments space separated, right? So it's going to get my and documents as separate arguments, but it's going to print them space separated. So it happens to work out in this particular case. But what if a file contains something like a new line, right? Like what if I make a directory called like uh, bad documents that um, hat m is a new line. So if I ls, you notice here, it gets all sort of like when it tries to print out the files, it has to do all this escaping to show me what that file is. If I now try to include that, oh, sorry, here as a bad documents, you'll notice that um, Echo gets all sorts of confused because this new line is just like tripping it up entirely. In fact, what happens here is the new line is stored as a carriage return, which is go to the start of the line. And so it prints dir my, oh, sorry, dir bad, and then it goes to the start of the line and then it prints documents, which overwrites the previous stuff it wrote, which is probably not the behavior you wanted. Um, so, uh, of course, as, as far as I've showed you so far, quoting is sort of, sort of the solution, but that doesn't really help, right? If I want to, let me just remove this bad file. Oh man. Uh, great. Um, because it's not always the case that I can just like replace this dollar ls with that, right? Because as for me, I don't necessarily know the files in the current directory. That's sort of the point. That's why I'm running ls in the first place. And so I can't just do the substitution. And so how do we fix this? Like, how do we fix the script to do what we want it to? Even assuming that we quote this correctly, right? This still does not work because of my documents. So you might imagine that I can do something like this. But think carefully about what that actually means. This means run ls take its output and place it where this dollar open, this dollar parentheses is. What that means is all of the files are going to be a single string. So if I run this, I'll get nothing. And we'll see why if I try to echo dollar f here, oops, uh, like so. Huh? Oh, do. It just prints all of the files as a single string. And that is because here we're just expanding ls into a single quoted string so they will not be subject to white space splitting, which is also not what we wanted. Well, so what is the solution to this? So the solution to this is a really handy thing in Bash called globbing. Um, so in basically, Bash knows how to look for files that match particular patterns. Um, for example, you have star, which means any string of characters. So match any string of characters. Uh, you have question mark for any single character. Um, so let's see how that works. So for example, I can do ls um, star, and that will show me, that will run ls with the arguments of what star expands to. Star in this case expands to all of these. Um, let's do, just to simplify a little. Um, so I'm gonna make a few files here. Bar baz. Okay, so if I do ls star, then star expands to all of these and ls will just list all those files. Similarly, I could also do echo and it will be given all those same things. Um, question mark is handy for when you don't necessarily want to match everything. So for example, this matches any three letter file name, right? So it will not print run pi and run sh because they are six letters. Um, I also have curly brackets, which lets me say something like anything that starts with B or R um, star. Notice that this did not print foo. So this expands to echo b star r star and b star expands to bar buzz and r star expands to run dot pi run dot sh. And you'll notice that is in fact what got printed out. Um, there are a couple of other globbing tools too, but none that are particularly important in this particular setting. Um, 
So going back to our for loop here, what we can do is just instead of doing ls, which just prints the files in the current directory, we can just do star. Um, and bash, when you use globbing, it knows that those are file names. And so it knows sort of what to split by. And so this will actually assign f to every file in the current directory, no matter what the name of that file is, so independently of spaces. Um, and if I now go back and make this my documents thing and run it, my documents get printed the way we would expect it should be. Um, we still need to make sure to quote it when we use $ref elsewhere, right, like here. Um, otherwise, this would still get it as two different arguments. Um, you can make pretty advanced patterns too with globbing, right? So you can do things like uh, anything that starts with A, or you can do something like uh, any dot text file in the directory foo relative to where I am. Or you could do even more advanced things like this. Um, so any file that starts with P followed by two characters that ends with dot text in any subdirectory of foo, run this command for. Right? So you can combine these in interesting ways and basically name exactly the file that you want or files that you want. Um, unfortunately, white space issues don't quite stop there. Um, for example, if we go back here, um, uh, let's do something like if foo equals bar, then uh, echo z. Actually, let's make this, I guess, dollar one. If I run sh with no arguments, sorry, if I run it with bar, then it doesn't indeed print z. If I print it with baz, it does not print z. If I run it with no dollar one set, notice that tests start complaining or the open square bracket program, which is test, starts complaining. The reason for this is the it is being run, the, so the test program is being run with no first argument. So if this is an empty string, bash does not pass it as an empty argument. It expands to no arguments. So test is just being run with the first argument is equals and the second one is bar, which is definitely not what you wanted, right? Um, and in fact, this is a source of a lot of uh, troubles in bash scripts. One workaround that exists and that is pretty commonly used uh, is to do this. And maybe you see why this works. Right now, even if $1 is empty, this first argument is not empty, and the comparison would still go ahead. In fact, we could test this, and this is a hack that's actually quite widely used. Now, bar will still work, and the empty string will not fail. So this is a pretty common fix, but it's not very satisfying, right? It's, it, it looks pretty ugly. Um, so the way to work around this, at least if you are in bash, is to do this. Um, double square brackets is not a program on my machine. So if I do, oops, um, if I do which double open square bracket, it says there's no such program in the path. It did not find that program. And that is because it is a, it is a bash built-in. And this program or this built-in understands the syntax underneath. It understands that this should always be an argument. It basically works the same way test does. Like double square brackets is pretty much a, a re-implementation of test, but where it, it understands the bashisms underneath. Specifically with double square brackets, even if dollar one is empty, it will still be counted as the first argument. So if I now do run a sh bar, it will work correctly. Buzz will print nothing and empty will print nothing. And so you no longer need this X hack. Um, but notice that this is a bash built-in. So if I tried to run this with sh, uh, on my system, sh is bash, so it doesn't actually work. Um, but if you were to try to run this on the system that actually just had sh, uh, like if it had ash, for example, actually, maybe we can just install, uh, it's not important. Um, but so in general, uh, if you use double square brackets, you will want to declare bin bash at the top, not just bin sh. Um, this also, if you use this syntax, you can also do things like double and, double ampersand for and, double 
pipe for ore, those kind of things, uh, which are harder to do with the with the built-in test program. There, you sort of have to use dash A, dash O for AND and OR. Okay, so we've talked a little bit so far about um, sort of the kind of cool things you can use the shell for and how to do very basic scripting. But where the shell gets really powerful is once you start talking about composability. In particular, the shell is powerful because it lets you compose multiple programs. Specifically, you can chain multiple programs together um, rather than have one program that does everything. And the key character for doing this is pipe, this character. Um, if you write a pipe B, what that really means is run A, also run B, send all the output of A as input to B, and then print the output of B. Um, to understand this a little bit better, you need to understand that all programs, all processes you launch, have basically three streams. Um, they have an input stream, which is known as standard in, written like this. Uh, they have a primary output stream, standard out, written like this. Uh, and they have a, a, a sort of secondary output stream called standard error, which is where you're supposed to write um, error output if any occurs. And by default, standard the, your terminal is going to say that standard in is your keyboard uh, and standard out is the terminal display, which means that anything a program... Um, so if, if I write Python program, for example, and I use the print function, what that will do is send the characters I gave to print to standard out, which just so happens to be my screen and therefore it gets displayed. Similarly, if you use something like read keys uh, or input, what that will give you is characters read from standard in. Um, sorry, print goes to standard out, uh, input takes from standard in. Um, but of course, your terminal can change that. Um, basically, if you type a pipe B, what that's going to do, what your shell is going to do, is it's going to change uh, A's standard out to be equal to B's standard in. So when B reads from standard in using something like input, it won't receive from your keyboard, it'll receive from A's output. And similarly, when you call print in A, what that will actually do, if you print or echo or whatever, it will print a standard out, but standard out will be B's standard in. But B standard output will still be your terminal, and A standard input will still be your keyboard. Um, you you have some manual control over this too, and you can play around with it. Like um, let's say that I echo foo, right? So uh, actually, let's do let's do cat. So cat is a very simple program. Uh, it reads from standard input and writes to standard output. So if I type echo and then press enter, then it printed out echo. Notice the reason I see this twice here is because my terminal, to sort of be helpful to me, shows me the characters I'm typing. So it shows me my standard in. But this is what I typed on standard in. So that is what cat received. And then cat printed back the stuff it got on standard in, just to its standard out. Um, what I can do is I can do something like cat um, open angle bracket, or sort of close angle bracket, means change standard out to point to this file. So here I could do cat.txt. Now if I type echo and then terminate cat with um, control D, which is sort of end of file, end of input, um, if, I now, uh, if I now print the contents of cat.txt, echo is a bad example here, uh, I am a cat. If I cat that file, if I, if I print the contents of that file, you'll say it says I am a cat. So here, when I cat it into this file, what happened was standard out of cat um, became this file, and so anything I typed to standard into cat ha ended up in that file. Similarly, I can use open angle bracket to change standard in to be the contents of a file. So here, I'm telling cat um, that standard in should come from here instead of my keyboard, and cat just prints whatever comes on its standard in, so it prints that to I am a cat. In fact, I can redirect both, so this is saying, hey, cat, your standard in is going to be the contents of this file, and you, your standard out should go to this file. So if you recognize, this is basically copy, right? If I now cat cat.txt, it says I'm a cat. And if I get cat two text, it also says I am a cat. And if this is confusing to you, I recommend you play around with it a little. Um, you can also redirect standard error um, using two and then that. Or you can redirect everything in bash using this. 
um, but those are less important. So, so let's go back to pipe because that is where we started. And uh, that is arguably the most useful of these commands. Why is this useful? Well, what it lets you do is it lets you manipulate the output of a program. For example, if I do ls, let's say that I only want to include files that like contain an O. I could do this with a glob, but it might not be what I want. Instead, I can pipe it through the program grep. Um, so grep is a program that searches for a pattern in all of its inputs. So I could grep for O. And what that will do is for every line in ls, it'll pass that line to grep. Grep would search for the character O and only print to standard output if the input contains an O. And I could make this more complicated too. So uh, grep supports more advanced parameters than O, like I can write full regular expressions here. I'm not going to go into that in this particular lecture because we cover that in the data wrangling lecture a little bit later in the semester. Um, but this is handy because now I can write one tool that is good at searching and I can use that across multiple places. For example, uh, if I type PS, it lists um, all of the programs I currently have running. If I run PS AUX, it prints all the processes currently running on the machine. And so I can do PS AUX and then I could grep for like, uh, I don't know, grep for my name. And I will show me all the lines in the process table that contain my name anywhere in the line. And notice I did not have to make like implement that searching feature in PS. Instead, PS just knows about printing things, right? Printing processes and greps knows how to search and the pipe lets us combine those two. And that is really powerful because you can go a lot further with that. For example, I can do journal CTL, which shows me the entire system log of my program since, since of my machine since the last boot. I can pipe that through something like grep for Intel. So this shows me all the messages. I guess I should have done dash B for the last boot. Search for everything that contains Intel, the string Intel, um, or like, um, let's say anything that says kernel. So that's a lot more messages. And then I could say pipe that again to tail, which prints only the last N lines and do say tail dash N5. So if I run this program, I get the last five messages from my boot log that contain kernel. And you'll notice that journal CTL did not know to have to know anything about searching or about looking at only some lines. Grep did not know, need to know about how to print system logs or how to only select a subset of its inputs. And tail did not know, have to know about system logs or searching. Um, but still, the, the pipe lets us combine these in useful ways. And I really recommend you look at the, um, the data wrangling lecture for a lot more on, on how to build interesting structures like this. Um, I can also combine programs in other useful ways. Like, for example, um, one thing I might want to do is I want to send an email to myself uh, showing me who is logged into the system. Well, I can do that too. Who prints everyone who's currently logged in. I can pipe that to send mail, which is a program that takes as input an email message and sends it to a particular email destination. Um, and I could say like me at example.com. And now if I run this program, it's going to send the list of who's logged in as an email to this mail address, assuming I've set up send mail correctly. Um, Bash also provides a number of other ways to compose programs, although many of them are even more sophisticated uh, and, and maybe not something you'll run into very commonly, but we'll mention them briefly. Um, you can group commands with things like uh, A semicolon B in curly brackets. Um, so for example, I could do um, journal CTL B grep I intel uh, journal ctl b actually it's a better example of this uh, let's say that i want to search for everything that contains an o in both the files and the actually no let's just say i want to search for my username in both the process list and the list of people who are logged in uh Sorry, that should be a uh, parentheses. I guess let's do head instead. So notice that now it ran who and PS and it combined their output into grep. 
and then I took the head five. And so notice that this will give me these three are lines from who, and these two lines are from PS. Um, and a, a lesser known, uh, a lesser known but really useful one is uh, process substitution. Um, I think I've mistakenly called the L1 process substitution. Uh, this is not process substitution. What I'm about to talk to about is, it's not terribly important what these are called. Um, so process substitution is really weird, but it is basically, um, if you write, what's a good example of this? Um, let's say that I want to look at the difference between, between two different, uh, the output of two different programs. So for example, I want to look at the difference between my last two boot logs. So journal CTL dash B minus one shows me my latest system, my latest boot log. Um, journal CTL dash B dash minus two shows me the boot log from the previous boot. If I want to show the difference between these, I could do this, uh, log one dot text, log two dot text. And there's a program called diff where I can give log one dot text and log two dot text, and it will show me the difference. Maybe not in a way that's particularly helpful right now, uh, but nonetheless, it shows me that difference. What's inconvenient here is that I need to give two file names to diff, right? Diff only has one standard in, um, and it it can't. Um, it's a little tricky to actually compare two the output of two commands because you can only provide one command on uh, as sort of the standard input to that process. And this is where process substitution comes in handy. If you write this. Uh, like so. Um, what this will do behind the scenes is Bash is going to start this program and start this program, create sort of a temporary file that it's going to put all of this program's output into, and then it's going to take that temporary file name and give that as this argument instead of whatever is here. So in fact, if I did echo here, see that the arguments that echo actually saw itself receive are these, which are just sort of weird file names for things that the kernel created for us or, or bash created for us rather, um, that happened each one to contain the output of these programs respectively. And so if I ran diff on these, I would get the same thing as if I wrote them to files individually, but without having to create the intermediate files. Um, one thing, so let's let's move on a little bit from composability uh, and talk more generally about the ability to run multiple things. One thing you might find is that um, sometimes you want to run longer term things in the in the background. Uh, a good example of this is if you want to run, say, um, a server of some kind, and you also want to run a client. Well, the ampersand suffix, if you put that at the end of a command, it tells Bash to run it in the background. Um, it will, and it will give you back your prompt immediately. So let's um, make an example of this. So I'm going to create server, uh, which is going to do what most servers do, which is sleep for half an hour. So if I run server, you'll notice it sort of takes over my prompt, right? This is just going to sleep, but imagine that it's some larger like web server or something. I can't do anything now. Right? If I type ls, nothing happens. I have to wait for that. I have to kill that server. So control C kills the current process. Uh, and then I can type ls. But if I really wanted to like, let's uh, do client as well. Success, because that's all clients ever do. So if I run client, that prints success. If I run server, but imagine that I have to run the server and now I want to run the client. I could open a new terminal, but I sort of don't want to do that. Like there's no reason why I should have to do that. Um, and so the ampersand suffix is really handy if you want to run um, two programs at the same time. For example, I can do server ampersand. And now what Bash is telling me is, okay, I started process. I started what you told me as process ID this, and this is the job number. This is sort of the background job number of server. And now I can run client, right? I gave, I got my prompt back, and the client is going to presumably connect to the server and do whatever it needed to and print success. 
And if I type jobs, it'll show me that this is one of the background jobs that's currently running. And I can bring it to the foreground with FG and then percent one. So percent one is job number one. If I just leave it, leave off the, the percent, um, then it's gonna assume that I mean percent one. And indeed, then I get back the server. If you have a thing that's currently running in the foreground and you wanna move it to the background, you can press control Z. So what control Z will do is it will stop the currently running process and put it in the background, right? So now if I do jobs, you'll see that this process is in the background, but it is currently stopped. And then I can type BG% 1 to say, run this process in the background. And if I now do jobs, it'll tell me that this thing is now running again in the background. And this is a good way to sort of move between multiple programs in the same terminal session. Um, of course, if you're just trying to run things that are relatively disparate, like an editor and a server or something like that, you might want to use something like tmux or screen, which we're going to talk about in the le next lecture on uh, the command line environment. Um, but this kind of low-level job control is really handy for when you just like want to start a server in a client, for example. Um, one thing you should be aware of, uh, let me just kill this for a second. Um, if you run a server like this, you can imagine you can also run this in a, in a script like run.sh, right? Um, if I run server and, and then I want to sort of keep around what hand, what, um, what process that was, I can do this. So dollar exclamation mark is the process ID of the thing that was last spawned in the background or the, the process that was last run. And now I can sort of echo waiting, and then I'm gonna like I don't know, run the client, echo done, and then I'm gonna kill. So kill sends a signal to a given process, um, telling it to, for example, shut down. So the default signal that kill will send is the kill the kill signal, uh, which basically tells that program to shut down, uh, and you give it a process ID. So in this case, that would be the PID that we stored from up here. And if I now run run sh uh, and then run jobs, you'll notice that there's nothing running in the background because the script sort of cleaned up the thing it ran in the background. So what about other stuff that's running in your process? Uh, actually, one more thing that's useful. Um, let's say that I run the server and now I'm trying to, like I want to log out from the machine. Well, first of all, I'm going to lose all the outputs. So I probably want to start this in the background with something like... Uh, server.log, right? But let's say I ran it this way and now I want to like log out from my terminal. Well, control C to put it in the background, to, to stop it and put it in the background, BG to run it in the background. But now if I quit this shell, the shell by default also shuts down any of its background processes, any of the background jobs. And so there's an additional step you have to take, disown, which basically says, I don't want to be responsible for this process anymore. So even if I die, let this process keep running. And so you can do disown percent one, and now that will keep running in the background, uh, no matter if you log out from your SSH session or whatever. Uh, okay, so let's look at um, other kinds of sort of similar things, which is other stuff running on your computer. So now we talked about background jobs and you've already seen PS, right? So PS lists all the other things that are running on your machine. Um, PS-A will show you all the processes running from all the users on the machine. Um, and there are a lot of arguments to PS. So man is sort of your friend on the command line, which will tell you more about the different processes that are, or the different commands you have available to you. So remember we looked at man test, right? There's also man PS. There's man for most of these commands. And usually the man pages will be pretty helpful about all the possible arguments you can give them. Sometimes it might be a little overwhelming, but if you, you, if you um, open this and then type slash, you can search in the man page for terms that are relevant to you. Like I could do search for something like all and enter and then N to go to the next matching um, next, next matching line. Um, if you want to find a process, so uh, let's say that I run the server in the background uh, and now from some other shell or later on, I want to find the process ID of that server. Well, pgrep, 
for process grep will take the list of processes and search for anything that contains the given name. Um, and so in this case, I could do pgrep server, and it will tell me that there are two process IDs that have server in the name. If you include dash af, it will also search the entire command line. So it also search arguments and it will print out uh, which command line that is running. So in our case, this shows us that uh, process ID this uh, 20,156 is in fact the server program that we ran just above here. Um, and let's say that we want to kill things some things later. So I mentioned the kill program. Um, kill sends a signal. Um, there's also pkill, which uh, is sort of a combination of pgrep and kill. So pkill server would send the kill signal to any process that matches server, which is sort of similar to um, this, right? So it's sort of pkill combines pgrep and kill. Um, if we look at kill, you'll see that it has the ability to send a number of different signals. Uh, if we do uh, kill-l, these are all the signals that kill can send. It defaults to sending um, dash nine, which is the sig kill signal. Um, so this signal tells the process to exit right now. So if I do kill dash nine uh, and then a process ID, what was our, I guess, 2156, um, the dash nine signal is gonna t force that process to exit immediately. It does not get an option to like clean up anything. It just has to exit right now. Um, the nicer way to tell a program to exit, if you just pass kill uh, or if you do uh, 15 or term, uh, so sig term is sort of a polite way to tell the process like, hey, it would be great if you quit right now. Um, the way these map to commands, if, if you press control C, what that really means is you're sending sig term. So you're saying, please exit. Uh, sig kill is tell the kernel to forcibly close this process right now. And it's equivalent to control backslash. So if you press control backslash, that immediately kills the current process, no matter what it's currently doing. Um, you very rarely want to do that because it means it won't get to like flush things out to files and those sorts of things. You generally want to stick to control C. Similarly to with kill, you usually just want to kill. Um, so if we look at man kill, uh, you usually just want to use uh, not specify the signal because then the term signal is sent, which is the polite way of asking something to exit. Um, and as they say here, it's used in preference to kill because you sort of want to allow the process to perform cleanup before it terminates. Um, so there, there's one more thing I want to cover before we finish up here, which is this notion of flags. Um, over, the, over the course of the commands we've run so far, you'll have noticed that in general for most commands, like if I type ls or ps or pgrep or kill, uh, many of these take what known as flags. So these are things that start with a dash. So for example, PS, I did uh, dash capital A. Uh, for PGREF, we had dash AF. In general, flags are ways to modify the behavior of the program you're running. They usually come in both a short and a long version. So if you look at man PGREF, you'll see here um, that there's for, I can either pass dash dash count or dash C, and they're basically equivalent, or dash dash delimiter or dash D. Um, usually, so this is a short and a long version for every flag, and the long version usually has uh, double dashes, while the short version has single dashes. Um, usually, you can also combine the short ones. So pgrep-af is the same as pgrep-a-f. Um, normally, there's a, also a dash dash help or dash h, which prints a short version of the man page, basically. It prints you um, sort of a... a, a condensed version of the help for that program. And this can be a, a very handy way to get a quick overview of what you can do with a given program and what kind of flags it supports. Um, there are a number of flags that are pretty common that you'll see in almost every application. So I already mentioned dash H for help. Uh, dash V usually means verbose. So for example, if I curl um, 
uh, google.com. So curl is a command line program that fetches the basically the website at this address and downloads just downloads all the HTML. So if I curl google.com, I guess get this value. Um, and if I do dash V, it'll be more verbose about what it's doing. So in particular, it'll show me all the HTTP steps that it did. So usually dash V means verbose. Often you can pass multiple dash Vs to make it even more verbose or just combine them because it's a short flag. Uh, similarly, usually dash capital V means version. Uh, so for most tools, dash capital P V will print out information about which, which version of that software you're running. Um, uh, dash A commonly refers to like everything or all. Um, so for example, you'll notice if I do ls here, I get these files. If I do ls dash A, it also includes dot and dot dot, which are uh, ways to move up. So, so dot is always the current directory, dot dot is always the parent directory. And normally those are not listed, but with dash A, which translates to dash all, um, dash dash all prints everything. Um, and finally, dash F usually means force. Uh, so normally, let's say that you're trying to remove a file. Um, it might say that this file is like write protected or something like that. So it will refuse to delete it. If you pass dash F, it will force remove that file, even though it would normally not let you do that. Uh, so generally, you should be careful with using dash F flags. Uh, there are sometimes you want to create files, and this is a this is a pretty neat trick. Um, sometimes you want to create a file that starts with a dash, and this can sometimes be a little bit tricky. So let's look at Touch. Touch is a program that lets you uh, basically just create. So it lets you change the time of a file, like when it was last modified. But if the file does not exist, it creates it. So it's a handy way to just create files. But let's say you'll notice that it has an argument. Um, called dash a, let's say I wanted to create a file called dash a. Well, if I do touch dash a, it says missing file operand because it didn't get file. It, it thought that was dash a. So how do I create this file? Quoting it didn't help. Well, normally for most programs, if you do double dash and then dash a, um, what the double dash means is everything that follows the double dash, uh, so everything from there and to the right, um, you should not interpret as a flag. You should only ever interpret as sort of positional arguments like file. So if I do this, you'll notice I now have a file called dash A. And I'll have the, the same problem actually with RM. Um, so if I do RM dash A, it's going to think that what I meant was the dash A flag to RM, which there might not even be one. In fact, if I do RM dash A, it'll say invalid option. So here I can do the same thing, double dash, dash A. And now dash A is gone. Uh, that's all I plan to cover for the shell lecture. Um, I recommend that you go to the, the Hacker Tools website and look at the lecture notes for this session, where we also have a number of exercises uh, that are useful just to familiarize yourself more with commands, how you can combine them, uh, and sort of interesting additional tools that are really handy to know about. I also recommend that you go watch the uh, uh, command line environment and data wrangling lectures if you found this interesting, because they go into a lot more depth on how you can combine these tools and how you can make your experience of working on the command line um, just sort of better in every way, how you can uh, use other tools to improve your experience on the command line and be more efficient. Um, but this at least should have given you an introduction to the what basically what the shell is and the kind of primitives you'll be working with along the way. So thanks for tuning in uh, and we'll see you in another lecture.